Uh, here we will now begin with the uh, prayer for illumination. Since we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your divine mouth, make us hunger for heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The uh, first uh, scripture lesson this morning is Matthew uh, chapter 14, verses 13 to 21, and we will read it in unison. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children." Unite. Okay. How's everybody this morning? So, can I, um, I'm going to wash my hands. Can you, I'm going to give you something. So, I want you to, do you mind? For you. All right. And me too. So we just heard, well, let's just do this and then, all right. And then we'll put them in a nice little pile on the floor. How about that? Okay. And I'll get them later. Okie doke. Cool. All right. So we just heard a story about the disciples and Jesus feeding 5,000 people with almost little to no food. They had, did you hear, what was it? There's a certain number of fish and a certain number of bread, pieces of bread. It was like, is it two fish and five bread or five fish and two pieces of bread? Adults? Two fish and five loaves, right? So this is um, a piece of, piece of bread that I made at home, uh, and a bread maker, just so, just so you know, so I don't want credit for, for doing it, right? But it, uh, sourdough bread, have you tried sourdough bread? Yes, no? Okay. Well, some people, all these people are out there to see Jesus, like 5,000 men and women and children, so there, it could be like, you know, 10,000 folks or more, right? And all they have is this, like this to feed them. And the disciples said, go send them, you know, we have nothing for them, but send them to the towns because they're in a deserted place, an unpopulated place, and go send them so that they can go buy food because they, they've been here all day and they're hungry. And Jesus says, no, take what you have and feed them. Now, a miracle happened. What's, uh, but what's interesting is uh, I read that some people think that the miracle is that people actually had food with them, but that they were willing to share it. What do you think about that? It takes away the, 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 the miracle of it, but it's, it's, it's the fact that, like, if, if all I have is this, and I need to feed all five of us, what can I do? could rip it up into pieces, right? And then I did this, right? And then I have enough to feed 
How many people? Well, yeah, but right now I have two, and then if I do it again, I can feed three people, four people, and on and on, right? Uh, was learning to share something that you had to learn? The answer is yes. The answer is yes to that. The, um, I read years ago when my kids were little that we don't really understand the concept of sharing until about age four. Before that, you're just like, it's mine. It's all mine, right? So I did this the same thing years ago with, with a bunch of kids, and I kept breaking up smaller and smaller and smaller. And I, by the end, every hand had touched it. Um, and... Uh, and then I'm like, oh, and then I, I'm like, okay, everybody can eat now. And all the parents were like, Ugh, because all the hands had touched it. And do you know what I'm going to do? Instead of doing the sourdough, just because it feels like it's a little stale. Um, do you like Ritz crackers? These go really quickly in my house. So, and I could say this is all for me, right? but I can also share of what we have. And if you listen to my message for, for the adults, you're going to hear this again. Would you like a Ritz cracker? Would you like a Ritz cracker? Would you like a Ritz cracker? Nope. Would you like a Ritz cracker? Okay. And, the, and I can share these afterwards. So I think that the miracle really happened that the, the fish and the, and the bread really multiplied. But I also think it's a good lesson to the idea of that what we have, we share with one another, right? If you see somebody, even it says in scripture, you know, like if you see somebody without, without a coat and you have an extra, give it to them, right? So it's that, so it's that type of thing. God is always asking us, you know, the way, uh, and this, you know, some people say, oh gosh, I'm so blessed, right? When we're blessed, we're called to be a blessing to other people with, with everything that we have, Right? Does that make sense? Will you bless me with a smile? Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's say a prayer. Fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Gracious God, uh, thank you for blessing us. Help us to be a blessing for others. Lord, we are grateful that we have uh, food to eat. And keep us ever mindful of people who don't have enough and share what we have. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture lesson is Psalm 23, and I'm going to read it from the New Revised Standard Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I am part of a teaching team, I've told you this before, for transitional ministry. 90% of the people who sign up for this have no intention of doing what I do. Uh, they just want to learn the skills of doing ministry in transition because it seems like the world and ministry is in transition. The team uh, a week or so ago was thinking of classes that we could offer in addition to, to this course that we're, that we're teaching. And it was left, you know, doing more on conflict, because that's, that's part of ministry too, dealing with conflict. Uh, talking about finances and sustainability for churches. And I offered up spiritual leadership in the wilderness. And there was a pause and the most senior of us, who is retired, <laughs> how many ministers who you know are retired, uh, it said, I think that should be part of this class and I think we should start with it. 
And then, of course, I was tasked to develop the program, you know, whatever, the, the unit on spiritual leadership in the wilderness. And I was thinking about it when I, when you think of leadership in the wilderness, you think of wilderness in scripture, I think a lot of, a lot of minds will go to the Israelites uh, escaping Egypt and wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and, and manna and quail and, and fire and cloud and God providing in all of that way. And then, because God is so good and I am so blessed, this passage came up in, the, the Matthew passage came up in the lectionary where Jesus goes off to this deserted space or a secluded space or a unpopulated space. It could be translated in all of those different ways. And I thought, oh my gosh, that that fits too, because there's lessons in this passage for us, spiritual leadership in the wilderness. When I first heard this this past week, I listened to a couple of lectionary podcasts, pastors talking about the scriptures that are in the lectionary. I heard this passage from Matthew 14 read aloud, and what what jumped out at me was the disciples focusing on what they lacked. And I thought, ooh, that'll preach that'll preach, because that's the temptation of every church. The focus on scarcity. It's really easy to focus on what we lack. If we only had more fill in the blank, if we only had more people, more money, more young people, more men, more time, more ideas, more parking, you know, we could make a long list if, if we wanted. And by the way, it's a great excuse not to do anything. You know, I would, but you know, we just don't have, right? In this passage, the disciples, out of compassion, tell Jesus, hey, there's, you know, there's no food here. Send them to the, to the towns nearby so that they can get fed. And Jesus says to them, no, you do it. Give what you have. Metaphorically and literally, give what you have. And then we know what happened. There's this feeding of 5,000 plus people. If you were told to give what you have, to focus on what you have and not what you lack, what would you come up with? I started a list for you. Time, compassion, the ability to listen, experience, wisdom, perspective, stories of God's faithfulness, a track record, love, a heart for justice, peace, truth. Take a deep breath. Let's keep going. Gifts for hospitality, good cooks, sewers, knitters, woodworkers, gardeners, scientists, teachers, healthcare professionals, coaches. I'll stop there. But you are blessed with many gifts. It is a rule of thumb that if God is calling you to it, then you have what you need, or at least what you need to start. If you are willing, God has a call for you. And that applies to each of us individually as well as as a church. We have discerned that the the calling, the mission, the purpose for Grace Presbyterian Church at this time is to connect with people through Christ, to serve the spiritual, physical, and emotional needs of the community and the world around us. To connect with people. How do you do that? You could do that in a million different ways. How will you? And you're already doing some things. Jesus and the disciples started with compassion, which is a great place to start. What breaks your heart for the people in this community? What are people hungry for in this community? It seems like people have everything, but we know better. Loneliness is epidemic. So, connection. Learning to help your loved ones with anxiety and depression. We're all affected. Grief. Work-life balance. Spiritual centeredness. Invitations to take part of of, of mission trips, uh, which feed the soul. It's always a win-win. And especially if folks have never been outside of the United States, it opens your mind and your world, and it's so much, you come back with so much gratitude. Or, you know, mission projects, you know, it here, uh, around us. And I was just reading online that says, you know, if for those who, you know, who, lack create, you know, who lack creativity, that's so funny when I'm talking about lack, but for folks who, who struggle, Matthew 25 is really concrete. 
feed people who are hungry, give drink, drink to those who are thirsty, clothe the naked, visit people who are sick and are in prison, welcome the stranger. But other questions that we could ask, what, what can we do to, to address climate change, gun violence, racial justice? You are all a art, music loving group. How can you connect that love with the needs in this community? And by the way, I believe that creatives are the, are the ones who are gonna to, to get us out of our stuckness as a society because creatives can imagine the world differently. And some would argue that we are all created creative. But how might we do that? Art as protest, art as prophecy, art as bridge building, and there's all different forms of art, you know. Art as inspiration for a different way of being and relating to one another. Art that complexifies when we would oversimplify. Art that opens our hearts to include more people, more ideas, more questions. Art that points to God who is our good shepherd. And I choose that, chose that metaphor on purpose and you'll find out why in a second. We could say to Jesus, the people are hungry and not just for food. And he says to us, feed them with what you have. So another interesting detail about this story is that Jesus is what comes before it and what comes after it. Jesus had just been told about the death of John the Baptist. So he went alone to be, he went to be alone because of his grief. Verse 13, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. And when the crowds heard it, they followed him on, fo on foot from the towns. When they heard what? Was it when they heard about John the Baptist being killed or when they heard that Jesus had gone off and they wanted just to connect with Jesus? Now we know that Herod did not want to kill John the Baptist because he was afraid of the crowds because they loved John the Baptist. So could it also be that the crowds in their grief followed Jesus looking for some hope, some word of hope, so much so that they forgot to bring food with them? I think we can imagine that. Another really interesting detail about the story is that what comes after is Jesus walking on the water, on the still waters. He comes from a boat you know, to, to this place, and they find him on foot. And then right after that, there's, he puts the disciples out in the boat, and then he walks on water, right? Now I want, I'm going to read the 23rd Psalm again with this passage in mind. And I'm going to say from the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In the Markan version of this story, of this gospel story that we just read, it says Jesus has compassion for the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He makes it very clear. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down on green pastures. Did you notice that in the passage that he said, it, uh, have them sit down on the grass? Why did they add that detail? I think they had the, the Psalm 23 in mind. He leads me beside the still waters. Again, coming from a boat, and he's about to walk on the water. He restoreth my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Again, thinking about Herod. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the, the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It all fits beautifully. In the juxtaposing of these passages, we see what the kingdom of Herod looks like out of abundance. We find death and destruction. And the kingdom of God made known in Jesus Christ where there is scarcity, where there is believed to be scarcity, we find abundance. In the Gospel of John, it says that right after this, in the, in the telling, and, and I don't think I said this, but this is the only miracle that is in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the Gospel of John, it says at the end of this, Jesus hightailed it out of there because the people wanted to make him king. 
So again, we have Herod's kingdom and Jesus' kingdom, proclamation of the kingdom. You know, he had enough people there to rally the troops to say, you know, hey, let's go to Jerusalem and make some noise. It could have gotten very ugly. But Jesus cho- chose a different path. Again, a wilderness story in scripture when he was tempted. He didn't choose earthly power. He didn't choose self-aggrandizement. He did not choose selfishness. He chose the path of love and compassion and sacrifice and grace. And he gave himself to feed the world. He invites us to that same lifestyle of compassion, sacrifice, love, and grace each and every day. In a world that will think that you're naive and foolish, and those disciples, can you imagine, okay, Lord, you know, we'll do it because you said, we'll see what happens, okay. That, that could have been their attitude, that could be our, our attitude. But in a world that, think that, that might think that we are naive and foolish to give of what we have to feed others, we are always pleasantly surprised. We can focus on the scarcity, what we lack, or we can focus on what we have. We have, you have, everything that you need to follow God's call. You have everything that you need. In Jesus' name, amen.